Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Edgy Futures podcast. Um, it's good to be back. This is episode 173. We had a short hiatus last week, if, you, uh, if you're if up to date. Um, we had a short hiatus last week because we were at um, a little thing called Bet in London, all three of us. So, um, lads, it's good to see you. How are you all? Yeah, doing well, man. I think probably for... Uh, we've got uh, our audience has changed a lot. I think in the last year, we used to, used to have a very educational technology audience. So for those who don't know, Bet, uh, one of the, in fact, I think it's the the fifth biggest tech, just technology um, conference in the world. Um, but it's it's around educational technology, uh, biggest educational technology conference in the world. Uh, yeah, it was good. It was good. To, I don't know about you, but seeing people in real life in IRL was. was yeah, it was bizarre. I kept just seeing people's faces and knowing who they were, but I'd never seen them in real life before. It's like, like if you've ever met a celebrity, when you're like, I know that person, but I don't know them. Dan, we used to work together, mate. Don't I know you don't need don't need to speak like that about me. It's really kind of you to say that, though. One of our, um, one of the network, one of the people that we we are aware of, posted a, a picture on on social media just after bed finished, just saying. Um, yeah, if just everybody I have met kept saying, didn't realise you were so tall, didn't realise you were so tall. <laughs> so I just said, just to bring that the, the status quo, I'll post the other half. Luckily, he was wearing trousers. But uh, yeah, it was a, an interesting thing when you... Because <laughs> how many... Over the last couple of years, we have your networks grow so much in um, in the work, world of the work that we do. And you go, oh yeah, I've actually never met you in person. Such yeah. a strange one. But it was a really good bet. And I think... We are advocates of online. We are advocates of everything else. But this whole blended thing of how important and how powerful was it to have face-to-face conversations? And, uh, yeah, it was a real positive one. I really enjoyed it. It was great to see you guys, spend time with you yeah. as always. And, uh, and yeah, someone was... who who probably wishes they didn't have that many face-to-face conversations is Ben. Because... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, yeah. mate. Yeah, I, uh, I've succumbed to the dreaded uh, Rona. Um, just kind of coming out of the other end of it now. I think. Well, I hope so. Anyway, it's still positive. I got I uh, tested positive. Um, yeah, uh, met, <laughs> I had loads of like face to face conversations. I think I don't think I, I didn't feel like I got that close to everybody, but um, thankfully, uh, I'm on the other end of that as well. So um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's been one of the, it's been a strange week of shortness of breath and if if i have to uh, stop at any point and turn my camera off because i have a coughing fit i apologize listeners and viewers um we're, we're not meaning to we've got a we've got a, a great guest that's going to be coming on the uh podcast in a moment just before we do i think it'd just be worth us just mentioning a few things that uh that are that are ongoing and that are upcoming i think I'm, i announced probably a little bit prematurely last last podcast uh look at steve's nodding there lucky that's his ceo nod that um, uh, he has a no, I'm, just trying, I'm just trying to get down to a microphone just so everybody's aware. <laughs> this is my microphone this evening, ladies and gentlemen. Before Ben and Dan get in there, I'm having my arms already aching, literally having to hold my microphone up. Are you going to uh, sing us so... a song, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> it'll be those... country. It will definitely be country if he starts singing. <laughs> yeah. What's that? Say? What yeah. that came across? Yeah. Very... Oh, <laughs> see you. Wow. You we, we, wow, we know wow, wow. we know you love so, country. This is sensible. Yeah. On this, <laughs> a lot, most people actually listen and don't and don't watch. So you're gonna have to explain what's going on, Steve. So just before um, I came on air, um, some people were giving me feedback at Bet, which is always uh, positive to receive. Not some feedback. people, mate. People who work with them for you. <laughs> They're saying uh, your sound's not great on the podcast anymore, uh, and, and there was lots of other criticism. Basically saying I, I don't look like I'm even paying attention, which was a bit unfair, but that's fair enough. But uh, so we were trying to sort out. But Dan's like, let's get it sorted, move over. I was trying to sort my microphone out and snapped it. So not only the stand, <laughs> I've snapped the actual uh, microphone itself at the bottom. So uh, yeah, I feel like I'm John Motson this evening, or some kind of guy that is should be uh, presenting or. Um, Announcing on the Grand National, I do feel yes. like one of those. I must admit. So, uh, but anyway, yes. <laughs> so yeah, the the bit of the thing that I announced prematurely um, is that on the thirtieth of June this year, we have got our uh, annual awards ceremony again. Yeah. Um, we're staying online for twenty twenty two, which is great, great news. Um, we'll be we'll be announcing loads and loads of stuff about it going forward. We've got some great partners that have already agreed to uh, work with us on it, and we're looking forward to celebrating educators and businesses this year as well and educational institutions that are pushing the needle really pushing the envelope and doing things 
innovatively and and, and pushing for the future of education and uh, challenging the status quo, which is what we're about. And uh, we love that celebration. So watch this space on that stuff. There's always that moment, isn't there? Because we, we do this every year and we get, we, we make it free, don't we? So we, we try to make it like a bit of a conference, a bit of a celebration. And we, we always want it to be free. So we rely on... We rely on sponsorship of the awards and and of the of the day itself, and there's always that moment uh, where we where we kind of go right. <laughs> is it going to happen? Are we going to? Is anybody going to be able to? Is someone going to be up for it? Uh, <laughs> backing us this year, and uh, and we always have that few weeks where we're like, is it? And I think that's probably why when you announced that on the podcast last week, we were we, we were kind of like, well, <laughs> well for me anyway, I was still in that stage where I was thinking, is it going to happen? Is it not? But uh, no, it's good, it, and it's amazing to see that. Um, the, some of the companies that have supported us for the last few years and some new companies as well are really getting behind this and getting behind celebrating um the cutting edge of education because this is this yeah. isn't an award ceremony like any other award ceremony we're not we're not doing teacher of the year we're not we're not we're, we're looking towards the horizon we're looking towards yeah. who's actually innovating out there who's who's moving this this sector into the future mm. um which is long overdue and we're and we're and we're shining a light on that so um yeah do We'll yeah, we'll be sending out a registration and nominations and all of that soon. So uh, yeah, we might have a little, big announcement. Well, that was, I was just about to say oh, we could be some big announcements. <laughs> I wasn't going to do the announcement. I wasn't going to do the premature announcement of that <laughs> like I normally do. But yeah, we've got some big news coming about um, speakers and people who are going to be involved as well. So very yeah. very excited about that. Should we get just, on to uh, inviting our guest? In? Sorry, Steve. This has been a, this has been a long <laughs> intro. Just bear in mind, our, our, our guest must be itching backstage. He's been waiting there for forty minutes, so uh, we'll bring him in. <laughs> <and> <laughs> he hasn't. He hasn't. He everybody. hasn't gone, has he? It's Paul lad. Like, it, it, it's, Thursday, it's now Friday. So uh, apologies for the long intro, but I think it was needed. Good laugh, as always. So uh, without further ado, we're going to bring in uh, our guest for today, which who is Gavin Cooney. Hi, Gavin. Hey, guys. Good to be here. Thank, thanks for inviting us. Thank, and thanks for uh, being patient as we carried on talking. And then we went, oh, we've got a guest in the background. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> Thank, thanks for joining us. Will you join us? We just found out before you we went on air that you are joining us from Austin, Texas today. That's right. That's right. So, it's, so it's gonna, is it like mid morning there? Yeah, it's like one o'clock and near, nearly one p.m. So oh, right. you're standing between me and my lunch. So let's make this quick, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, thanks for joining us. We've we've uh, met before online and had a few conversations. I know. Um, we heard about your uh, organisation, Learnosity, which we'll get into today. But I wondered if you could just give us a little bit of an intro to you and a little bit of your journey. Um, because our, our listeners, as we've told you before, are a range of people, educators, senior leaders, um, people who are just interested in the future of education. And we know that what you, the journey you've gone on will, will, will really tell a story for that. Yeah, brilliant. Look, I mean, um, yeah, it's something I've big passion for the whole education space and uh, the story really kind of begins just about 20 years ago um, I I know it doesn't I don't seem that old but uh, I was um, I was I did that after I finished in the university I did lecturing for a year loved it and uh, then I went off to go backpacking with my buddies and I went to Australia I'd been offered a job with I, I was doing kind of a cell phone startup in Ireland we did the kind of third operator there um, but I went off to Australia with my friends to go backpacking and, and whatever. Got to Sydney kind of, you know, for six months and I stayed for six years. Um, and I got a two day contract in February 2002 in what was called the Board of Studies Department, the kind of Department of Education. They do the curriculum and, um, and the assessment. And I was a programmer. I had a business background. I did a business degree, business master's, but I was a self taught programmer. So I was just kind of solving web problems for them and, and tech problems. And they would kind of let me do kind of innovation stuff. They kind of say to me like, yeah, we need to do something around kind of news for teachers. So I went and I kind of downloaded blog software because blogs were very, very new. And I just implemented like news.borderstudies.nsw.edu.au. It's gone now, but I, I, I implemented that as a, as a blog and then all the teachers will get their, will get their news feed. And then they kind of said to me, look, we need to do some around like online assessment. The minister's talking about doing online tests. So I was like, okay, I kind of downloaded the old exam papers from their, from their website and created an assessment engine. I didn't know there was an industry. I didn't know there was like anyone else doing it. I just kind of found it like, just took it as a web problem. 
And it all kind of started there. We had all these other governments come and visit us, going like, oh my God, how'd you do this? Like, is it not obvious? It's just like four radio buttons and a next button. And, you know, it was that multiple choice, obviously. And um, we realized very quickly that there was kind of a, like a business in it. And it was kind of something we could do to help. I was very passionate about the kind of education space. And I'd sort of, uh, you know, benefited a lot from my own kind of education and, and loved it and wanted to kind of do more and make that difference. And what happened really was... Like, I was always going to start a company. Like, if you asked 12-year-old Gav what he was going to do, he would have said some version of, well, stuntman, probably, and then entrepreneur in some way, or some, I would have said CEO or entrepreneur or whatever, whatever vocab I would have had at age 12. And it would have been, like, the cell phone company again. It would have been something around that if I had been in that industry. But I really kind of, the education really, really gelled with me. And what, what happened initially was I was in, I was basically appalled by the bad technology that there was in education. I'd come from some bit more innovative and I realized that, you know, you take a surgeon out of a hospital from, you know, a hundred years ago and you plant him in a hospital today and he has no idea where he is, uh, what the drugs do, what the machines do. It's just completely night and day. You take a teacher out of a classroom from a hundred years ago and you put him in a classroom today. It's kind of the same thing. It's still chalk and talk. It's the same as when I was a kid. And, and I always say it's the same as when Jesus was a kid. It's just chalk and talk. So that kind of, frankly annoyed me it just kind of I thought that was kind of the worst thing because there's not enough innovation there's not enough uh, um, investment there's just not enough nothing it's just not moving fast enough so I thought I'd make a big difference so we kind of embarked on on, on creating this technology and, and and building a company around that around that kind of main mission that's good and I guess the when you go and start in your own business, especially when you're kind of going from working for somebody else, and then you're thinking, actually, we've got, I've got a good idea here. Uh, this could mm-hmm. be something that actually makes an impact. What was, what, were the, what was that first six months to a year like? Did you was there was there big mistakes made? Was it was there some failure? How did you how did you yeah how did you navigate through that? Yeah, you have to be philosophical about it. I wouldn't like there was plenty of mistakes, but it kind of all led me to the to the journey I'm on. Right, so for about. We started this around 2006, really, like as a business, like moving away from just, um, you know, getting paid a steady wage. And I, I found a guy, uh, Mark Lynch, who's still my, he's my co-founder and he's still my business partner. And he was a, he wasn't a self-taught programmer. He was like, he was an engineer who could do this properly, right? And um, we worked together, but it was literally five years of just trolling muck at a wall, trying to make it stick and it not work it me not getting a salary for a couple of years, just like relentless, just trying to go, like just walking the floor at best, trying to meet people and trying to run a bit, trying to build a business, getting on a plane and going to a conference and just like not having a stand or not having a anything, just kind of, you know, putting on a cheap suit and trying to walk around and, and, and trying to uh, trying to do it. So like, the first five years were incredibly, incredibly difficult. But, you know, you're, you're in the late 20s or whatever, like you don't need sleep uh you know you can live on beans and toast and li- like literally just like on the bread line for for a number of years and and after about five years something kind of hit and we kind of found a value proposition of something that would actually work and something that would kind of make a bigger impact in the education space so like I, but it wasn't there was no quitting for me i was just like it didn't really occur to me that i could quit i was just like oh well i'll have to try the next idea and make and, and let that work and i just kind of kept on going and 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 just kind of listening to that, there's that that trial and error stuff, but there's also the, that there's, it comes from that frustration, doesn't it? Of th- there's got to be something better than this, and I know that that's that's ultimately the birthing of this innovation here has come from a, a we we talk about that uh, Danny Miller's formula for change, which you've probably heard about that idea of the disf- dissatisfaction with the status quo is the kind of starting point, isn't it? And if you've yeah. got a, if you've got a a challenge to education that says it's just not doing what it needs to do. And actually it's not moving anywhere near fast enough because ultimately what you're saying here is that the education system wasn't doing or assessment particularly wasn't doing what it needed to do or what it could do or meeting its potential. And therefore that has an impact, not just on teachers and on schools, but on the most important people that are going to those schools, which is the students, isn't it? 
Yeah, I just didn't think educational technology in general was moving. I ended up focusing on assessment, but it just in general, ed tech wasn't where it should be. And as I went and as I kind of went for five years without kind of, you know, as I said, on the breadline or whatever, nobody said like, oh, this is a bad idea. Or nobody said like, you haven't got, that this isn't something that needs to be solved. It was just kind of really hard to kind of make ends meet and to kind of make enough sales and, and so on. Um, and it was all kind of hard fought and hard won, the, the, these battles, you know, the, these sales or whatever I was trying to make. And uh, But yeah, it was fundamentally around a belief, as you said, that it wasn't good enough and, and, it, and it should change and not accepting that status quo. And that's a great way of describing it. I'm, I've, uh, I've an uncle who uh, I'm very close to and he was, he, he always described me like a seven-year-old versus a kind of 37-year-old or whatever it was. And, you know, as, as, a, as a kid, I, I wouldn't sort of accept things that like, I didn't accept the status quo. So I didn't particularly like playing soccer, but I just, I, I'd be happy over here playing Lego. And when the guys are finished playing soccer, we'll, 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 we'll play. And there was sort of something in my personality that said I didn't just kind of go along with the, with, with the, with the crowd. I, I, I kind of forged my own path. And this was it. I, 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 as you said, I really believe this should be better. I, re- I believe that was sort of, I was offended by the fact that it wasn't, it wasn't better and I wanted, I wanted to make it, I wanted to fix it. So I wasn't taking no for an answer. So I just kept, kept on going and uh, eventually kind of came across something that really worked and kind of took off. It's really interesting. I think um, over the last few months we've we've met and had some brilliant conversations with with people like Josh Dan, but um, his name does um, elude me right now, but the guy who started Kid O2 uh, or Kid R2. Sam, the... Sam Gichiru. Thank you. Appreciate it. So all these people, these wonderful disruptors that just were not happy with the current state of play in either mm-hmm. their country or just education just as a whole, and I think it takes a really unique person to then say, I think I'm going to do something about it. That entrepreneurship, that that whole thing, that drive to do something different because there are so many people that are unhappy with the status quo um, and with what's going on, but would not have the thought to think, right, what do I actually do and how do I actually solve this or help to solve it? So, yeah, it was more of a statement rather than a kind of question really. But, yeah, it, it's really interesting to see this new wave of, of influences, disruptors, but I think it's a real positive change and one that we definitely champion. It's brilliant to hear, definitely. Yeah, look, look a bit like Liam Neeson, I had a certain set of skills that I could use, right? <laughs> and uh, I wanted to kind of keep on keep on at that. And, and like, I, I, I was a technology guy. I'd been a self-taught programmer. You know, um, I, was, I was into it and I kind of knew that if I could take some of the skills I had, uh, I, I could, like, think about the business background and so on. I kind of knew that I could do that. I found an amazing co-founder. It's, it's, I know this isn't an entrepreneurship podcast, but like the main thing as an as a entrepreneur is finding a good co-founder. And it was kind of yin and yang there. I was, he was a real engineer. He could really deliver a kind of large scale, excellent software. Uh, and there's kind of a certain, set, certain proportion of people in the world who can kind of do technology and a certain proportion of people who kind of talk about it and explain it. And I was luckily right in the middle of that Venn diagram. And I could do both and I could use those skills then to kind of make a massive impact. And that was the ultimate thing, right? So I wanted to make a big, big impact in, in, in education. That's kind of what we're going to talk about is, is what that impact was and, 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 how, and how we went about, uh, about doing that. What's, what's uh, fascinating here is, is that I think just as listening to your story there, you talked about getting a business degree, getting a master's in business, but then being a self-taught programmer. Um, yeah. and, I th- and I think there's, there's probably – you probably thought about this more than, than I have because I've just, just thought about it now. Um, but the, that whole idea that the self-taught programmer stuff was was the key bit in that in that in that cake, wasn't it? In that in that in that mix. Yeah. Because you've then realized there is something that in this, and then I found the the skill set to add to that um with with a co-founder. But I think there's also something in that as well that you've st- the formal education bit had been done, but actually, mm-hmm. it, the value was in the stuff that you that you'd learnt yourself, and that you that you'd have that that love of learning to find out yourself. Was it was it just kind of that you were interested in? Because you talked about Lego, was it the same kind of principle about making things work that made you want to go and do that, or was it or, or, or was it the idea that actually we've got to get into tech if I'm gonna I'm coding if I'm gonna make anything big in the world? 
Yeah, I mean, I probably should have done computer science or something. And it was not, like I started university in 1995, right? So I'm not sure computer science was kind of top of, top of the list there. Uh, I was, it was business. And, and when I came out of having a master's in business studies, like wh- when I started doing entrepreneurship, I realized how little I knew about business. It was, it was kind of what, what it taught me really was what like education was kind of what was left when I forgot all the things I knew like forget the facts or whatever was what was left. And they kind of created this kind of in, in business school, they kind of created this on an entrepreneur and, and somebody who looked at things in a certain way. So I went to a restaurant, even today, I went to a restaurant and I go like, how many pizzas can they make an hour? How much should they charge you for? How much does that dough cost? What's the, like, you know, trying to work out what the business model is in those places. And I took that kind of business view uh, uh, in, in education and, 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 look, and looked at it that way. And, um, and I was fascinated by technology and I, I was kind of good at it. My, my, like, you know, we did, I didn't come from um, any kind of um, wealthy background or anything, but no, my dad, had, instead of taking a, a Christmas bonus one year, he take, took take home a, a secondhand computer from work. And that was when I was about 12. And I was just kind of fascinated by it and I built up on it and kind of taught myself technology in those kind of ways. So it was a kind of a problem solver. And then I kind of started applying that to kind of business and to, to the kind of business of education. And I was able to kind of take those skills to go after it. So, um, and really that, like, I started taking some modern technology stuff into the education space. And, and that's where it kind of comes down to. There was, like, it, there was this emerging thing of, of APIs. Um, and what I realized very quickly was when I started this, working in the Department of Education, was that I had to create everything from scratch. So if I wanted to build an assessment engine, I had to start with like JavaScript or some basic language and build it all from scratch. Whereas in other industries, there was APIs and it was kind of services. It was kind of an emerging trend in that, right? So there was kind of payment processing stuff like like um, Stripe for, for MasterCard or Visa or Amex or something. There was, uh, if you think about Uber, right? So Uber couldn't have built their business if they had to build everything from the beginning. Imagine them trying to map the world. Like, it would be absolutely impossible. They were able to use an API from Google to use those maps. They use one for directions, for background checks, for payment processing, for, you know, a load of things. Uh, messaging, SMSs, and phone calls, and everything else. There's Twilio. So I looked at that, and I realized, well, there's a whole... Other industries have this kind of thing. And education are stuck the education industry is stuck building these things like very from the, from the, from the base level upwards. And, and that was the core innovation. It was kind of realizing, well, actually, if I build these, like I talk about Lego bricks. So if I build, if I give these Lego bricks to the industry, they can build whatever they want on it. They don't have to recreate the bricks. They don't have to kind of start from the beginning. And on that, then you can build, they're standing on the shoulders of giants, right? You can kind of build on top of that a bit like Uber can, can create a, create a company or, you know, think about maps again, uh, hotels.com, booking.com, Airbnb. They're all using the same maps. And what, what matters is what's built on top of that. So I was able to take those, like provide a Lego bricks, provide an API into education. And that's that's what the business was. That's interesting because I think if you ask most educators what they want from educational technology, they're not going to say, give me another tool. Give me something else that I've got to learn and something else I've got to use along with this big list of other things. They, they want something that's going to make what they're already using more efficient, don't they? They want things that, and, and one way to do that, and probably the most important way is for what they're already using to, to communicate with each other, to create those workflows between the tools that they're already using. Because there's, there's nothing worse than, and, and every teacher in the world will, the world will have done this, and inputting data or doing something with one tool and then having to replicate it and replicate it and replicate it. And it's we live in a world where... There's some technology out there, right? And, yeah. and, and there's nothing kind of consumer level. They need training and stuff. I think about it, like you never needed to get trained to use uh, Facebook or LinkedIn or, or Google search or whatever. It was kind of intuitive. was kind of consumer level uh, usability. And it was nothing like that in education. And everybody... Well, I, I felt one of the reasons was because all the technology companies, all the publishers and so on, we're, we're, we're spending so much time building stuff. If I could kind of elevate them to a certain level, they could kind of focus on, on, on usability. And the thing about it is that it was a crucial, crucial point in Lernosity where we decided we were building education technology. We, what we could have done was we could have said, okay, I can, I don't like, you know, millions of dollars in, in funding or anything. So what I, I could do is I could pick a niche. So I could go, I could build a year seven math product or a year 10 geography product, something kind of niche and, and, and for say schools and sell it that way. 
And the big thing was we decided that we wouldn't do that. What we would do is we would power other people's products. So there's no teacher or student knows who Learnosity is, but they're using them all the time. We've got really, we're really, really far reaching in that way. But we were able to provide tools to allow every publisher, every testing company, every learning platform, every learning management system to innovate and to, and to, to reach further. And that just made, that made the whole industry kind of rise with the tide of the innovation in Learnosity. So if you go to, say, um, the NCTM, which is the National Council for Teaching Mathematics in the U.S., there's about a dozen products in there that are powered by Learnosity. If you're product number 13, you can either license from us, and we'd sure love you to do that. Come on board. Here, here it is. Sign up, whatever. That's great. Or you need to build a product every bit as good as what you would have built if you had had Learnosity. So we've made things standard that were not standard before. So different types of questions, um, drag and drop. We've got 60 different question types in there, including a lot of math stuff, graphing, Cartesian graphing, charting, auto-scored math, multi-step math, all sorts of things. And, and that's now standard, right? Um, teacher authoring, um, scalability, accessibility, better reporting, uh, some analytics around kind of large groups and so on. That's all standard because we made them standard. So we now have shamed the whole industry into building a better product for a student. And that's the impact we make is because now you can't have a viable, commercially viable product in, in say math in the US without having kind of Learnosity standard features. So it's a phenomenally powerful thing to just kind of shame the whole industry into, uh, into, into doing better we provided all those building blocks and, 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 and let them work. So, uh, and, you know, and there's some, we, and in the meantime, then we're powering, what, 130, 140 different uh, companies. So um, everything from, like, a lot of brand names you'd recognize, you know, Pearson or, or Schoology, um, Hot and Mifflin, some Google stuff. Um, and... We're powering the, these big, big names, and nobody knows who we are. We're just behind the scenes, kind of helping them innovate. And we have like 40 million students uh, annually on, on, on the platform. Last year, we delivered 17.3 billion questions. That's billions with a B. Uh, so it's a massive, massive impact. Uh, and today is a Thursday in March, right? So we're going to have something like four or five million students today doing their homework or assessment on Learnosity today. So think about that. It's sort of we, we're so much more motivated to build a better system with, with 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 better functionality and so on. And we can also go to the kind of niche bits of functionality that wouldn't be possible before, especially say in accessibility. Let's say you've some thing and you've got like one in a thousand students is going to need this feature or this accessibility bug or whatever it is. Well, we've forty million users. So if we don't do it, we've got like forty thousand students who are going to be disappointed. Okay. Whereas it doesn't make sense for any other company to build something that has a one in a thousand use case. Uh, and you can, you know, one in 10,000 use case, all, all these different things. So we, we were able to kind of go what I call a mile deep and an inch wide on certain bits of functionality just to make the whole thing innovate. It, uh, yeah, it's, it's, how, it's an amazing achievement what you're doing. And it, you. it, I, I guess I know you said before this isn't, this isn't an entrepreneurial podcast. Um, but I, I think I think it is. I, to, to be honest, I think <laughs> <laughs> I think I think on, entrepreneurialism is is at the foundation of good education, mm -hmm. and 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 I think we all we the skills of a good entrepreneur we it should be the basis of of any education system. Um, and and I'm just the wondering, futurist bit, right? Part yeah, of the EU yeah, bit, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I, I when I think of that, I think, and I guess like with all successful products or successful companies you, you now that you now that kind of you guys are the standard and and if people aren't meeting that standard like you say what 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 why did you and this this might be difficult to answer i guess but why why do you think you got there first well how did is it is it the fact that you know like a lot of people say well, it, it being an entrepreneur is about actually doing it and like a million people will have the idea it's just the person who actually gets off their ass and does it mm -hmm. is is that is that the key ingredient what's the key ingredient that 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 gets you to that stage i guess i'm asking well we were pretty early right there was kind of five years where we weren't successful at all at all right and uh, we found our little niche 
And we were quite early in the idea of having an API. And there was a little bit of kind of visionary stuff in that, right? Um, and, I were, and, and we're quite early in that idea. And like when I came, when I came out with an API in, in, for assessment, I had to go to conferences and explain what API was, like walk in and go, right, there's this thing called an application program interface and explain what it was and introduce the concept and then, like, I was even going to CTOs and stuff, and they're like, an AP what? Like, what, 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 do you, what is it? What is this? And now we had to create a space. That is not easy to kind of create a whole space in an industry. Um, so we were quite early. I'm sure other people would have come along later on, but, like, there isn't too many of them out there. You kind of have them um, clever doing kind of login stuff. Um, there isn't too many APIs in there. Um, but, yeah, we were, we were pretty early, and it's pretty difficult to do. And then... Um, but I, I mean, I've always been kind of worried that somebody will come along with the kind of the next new the new thing and whatever. But um, they haven't really. I think one of the things I think about, and now we're talking about education and, and, and entrepreneurship. What, here's one of the worst things that happens in uh, in education: is you get a, an innovative startup, somebody like me, who comes along and they get like to about a million dollars of revenue, and they get scooped up, bought by a publisher, and now they're a dev shop for McGraw Hill or for, um, for Pearson or whoever. And it just stifles all of the innovation in, in the market because you've got a guy who's probably exhausted like me, has worked for five years, who hasn't got anything, hasn't achieved any success and so on. Somebody comes along and says, look, I'll, I'll buy this off you for whatever. And you're just kind of going like, oh, thank you. You know, like I, I'll have a job and I won't, I won't go in there. There was something about me that, that didn't give, give up. And, and that's, that isn't giving up. That's, that is a, 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 a certainly a definition of success. But we realized early that to power the industry and to be successful, we need to be, to be Switzerland. Uh, I know Switzerland get a lot of press for being ne- neutral, and I think we're Irish too, uh, and Ireland's neutral too, right? So, uh, but we needed, to be, we needed to be neutral, it was massively important. So we decided very early that we were just gonna blow off any suggestion that we would, um, that we would kind of set up as a publisher, um, and, and we, we thought that, would, that was kind of minimizing the impact we can make back to the core tenant of one, one thing to kind of change education. So all of the publishers would have, said, would have had a conversation. Yeah, we'll give you a license, but we want to take 5%. We want a board seat. We want an investment. We want a majority. And we were like, no, I'm not even going to entertain that conversation. I'll stop you right there. I'm not entertaining the conversation. And there was a few things there. One was they all knew that if I was stopping them mid-sentence and shooting them down, that they were, I was actually genuine about not selling to one of their competitors. So it was their worst nightmare as well. And promised them Switzerland and delivered Switzerland. And over a number of years, you can go back to somebody three years later and say, look, I know you didn't want to buy in or you didn't want to use this thing three years ago because you were afraid it's going to be bought by your number one competitor. Well, it's been three years. I've delivered on my promise. I haven't been bought by your competitor. I'm now powering everyone around you and your product is suffering because of that. And by the way, we're now kind of too big to be bought by one publisher and kind of closed down. And because we took that chance, we, um, we, we were able to kind of be bigger than just sort of just a dev shop for a publisher, which was not at all interesting. I think that is um it's, it's a great business model <laughs> um you don't need us to tell you that so i, I, I know i'm not giving you that uh that um, <laughs> like it, it is me uh, I, I work work on my own um and now i'm trying to give you some business i'm not i think, I think what, <laughs> what, what, I'm, what i'm saying is is that that idea of sticking true to what you're trying to achieve and then i suppose that that kind of comes out of a set of values and it? it comes out of a set of you, you you built a company that's grown big and, and grown wide but also been based on 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 values and i think uh it doesn't take very long to go and find out where you and the company have kind of put as your values and you met you kind of mentioned that idea of first about um about changing education that that, that we've got a moral almost almost like a moral imperative isn't it to do better uh but but i think it'd be worth if we can underpinning all of the stuff that you talked about in terms of the product um and i know we haven't necessarily gone into loads of that but but in terms of the values that sit behind it the idea of one one of the things that i loved when i found out is about you believe that education is a human right um yes. and and even though it says that in the in the united nations 
human rights declaration. Like it's got to be something that people believe, isn't it? And I, and I, I get that from what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, like when we put that, when I wrote that, uh, I didn't realize it was something that was in the. Uh... It was in the, the UN uh, declaration, and I was a little disappointed I didn't make it up myself. To be honest with you, um, it's going to be one of those court cases like Ed Sheeran's lyrics or something, where where you know I'm trying to claim that I made it up myself. But I do believe that I do believe it's a human right. I do believe it can kind of um, education and learning in general can. You know, I'm here in America at the moment, right? And one of the things you notice in any American city is there's a there's a line somewhere, and there's kind of the really rich and there's the really poor. Like I'll be in LA for uh, this weekend. And there's going to be a bunch of rich people in restaurants. And then there's going to be a bunch of minorities, like valet in the cars and serving us food and, uh, and cooking the food. And just this line, the dichotomy in society, the rich and the poor. And education is the way forward for that. It solves all of the problems. If you want to cure cancer, you teach kids how to be better doctors and 20 years time to cure cancer. It's, 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 that's what you do, right? So we believe that education is kind of the root to all of the social problems. It's, it's a human right and everybody um, sh- should have that. And that, make, that means the kind of mission is around kind of making it inclusive, making it equitable, making it accessible to everybody. And that kind of accessibility piece is a big part of what we're doing. And it happens to be something that, that everybody needs, but um commercially but it's, it's it's very much it starts with that it's, it starts with with the accessibility needs to make it make education available to everyone and then it's kind of that's the mission piece and then there's kind of a few values that we we kind of work on around and the first thing is kind of doing the right thing it's, it sounds cliche cliche but it's like fairness um and do the right thing is just a huge kind of bedrock to the business and being open and honest and taking kind of responsibility and there's lots of opportunities to kind of make an extra book by kind of um, doing something that kind of screws over a client and ultimately who suffers there is, if there is a student, we can kind of make a, a better company and we can reach more students if we kind of do the right thing and, and kind of show that honesty and, and so on. And then there's another value around aiming higher. We kind of think we can raise the bar here in education technology. technology. We can use our skills um, to, to tackle those kind of bigger challenges. And then... Uh, the third one then is around kind of um, sharing and uh, success is better shared. So um, that's kind of works with employees. It works with our partners. It works with the, the, the working with students or, or, or whatever else. It's sort of like we, we don't need to gouge every penny out of someone who doesn't need to be a, it, it, we can kind of take a small, small, small cut out of what's happening and just sort of get many, many more users and just think of their long, term again going back to the entrepreneurial fundamentals here we can have customers that will last 20 or 30 years we have a bunch of customers already that are around since day one sort of around like 13 years and they don't and they don't go anywhere because we deliver on these things and, and we don't um, and we share this success with them they win and then and, and, and after that we win and it's, and it's a core part of the of the business as, as, as you as you said in the intro question I, th- I think i think that's that's important we we we, re- we regularly talk about um, the power of collaboration, good friend. Um, I must reference. Mm-hmm. I reckon we should get some kind of uh, cut from David Price because we met, we reference his book, The Power of Us, pretty much every episode because he talks <laughs> about that that power of collaboration and actually the companies and the um, educational establishments that are making real headway are those that that acknowledge that this is a shared journey. Um, mm-hmm. And, and and almost like you talk about partners as a, as opposed to just customers. Um, I quite like that. And I know that there are some people that that's it's terminology like that, that makes a difference. It's very deliberate. It's funny because I'm watching three different TV shows. I mean, what, what are you binging right now? I'm binging three things. And one is about Tyrannos. One is about WeWork. And one is about Uber. And those three companies are not built by nice people who are trying to do, they say they're trying to do good for the world, but they're fundamentally sociopaths. And that's what makes them good TV shows. But there's like plenty of opportunities along the way to kind of, to 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 um, to not be a nice person. And, you know, but if, if we, what I believe you can kind of be successful. There's actually an episode I was watched there a little while ago about the, about the Uber one. And um, it, 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 there was just a moment where he's kind of going like, yeah, I could be nice here or I could be, asshole and i'm going to go the asshole route and it's like okay so and that's just something we deliberately decide not to do 
It is an interesting one. Um, I have stepped out of the education space and service and support education uh, now with a with a different hat on. And uh, yeah, it's an interesting one to when you uh, when you follow your beliefs and values. And I'm sure you must have come across it that mm-hmm. um, it's not it, it is few and far between in regards to people that do follow their moral compass and base mm-hmm. things on uh, beliefs and values. So it's an interesting one of how you've managed to. Uh, continue to drive forward and, and I suppose it links into beliefs and values around this whole assessment thing and assessment not being just for one purpose and I know you've mentioned some big organizations some big awarding bodies that have potentially the software and everything that goes with it we still have this thing where actually the end goal for a lot of those awarded bodies in the UK in England but not necessarily globally where mm-hmm. it is then writing on a piece of paper uh, in an exam hall. So actually in terms of your feeling and everything else based on your beliefs and values, how, how does that sit with you in regards to the great work you're doing, but then actually the end point still being driven by some of those awarding bodies to, to be, um, yeah, in the way that. Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't do so well uh, with three hour written exams right now. My hand would fall off. I haven't written it in <laughs> 10 years. And should I be disadvantaged by that? I don't think so. I did something like 56 exams in university. They were all three-hour written exams. I swear to God, my hand would fall off. I did, a one, did one right now. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done so well. And, and um, people are learning differently. And I don't really see why they, they, they have to kind of go back to a paper-based uh, kind of essay-based assessment. It's not a great, great way of, of assessing. And... You know, there's a, there's, there's a sea change that's happening right now in, 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 in education. And it was um, it was just kind of trying to replicate education straight onto paper and adding no value to it. Uh, and now you can do something that's more dynamic, that's more kind of online, that's more interactive. It was just kind of doing multiple choice. And now it can be more question types. It was sort of controlled environments like, say, Windows machines. And now it's kind of... Macs, Linux, iPhones, you know, Android, and and and, the, and and there was things like there was occasional assessment at the end of a semester or at the end of a year, and now it's much more formative and much more kind of continuous assessment. And like formative assessment, I don't think I kind of realized what it was when I first began this, but like when I was doing my um, equivalent at A levels, the Irish equivalent at A levels, since the leaving cert, I remember one day I was trying to nail a concept in math. I say math now because I'm in America and I'm sorry. I'm sorry to all the English listeners, maths. And um, I, I remember it was, it was proof by induction and I couldn't get it. So what I did was I got my book and I, I borrowed my friend's book and I did, I spent a weekend doing like 30 different proof by induction proofs over and over again until I got it. And when I got it, I had it and I moved on, right? And that is formative assessment. That's doing and getting feedback and, and, do, and doing it again. And that's the kind of thing you can enable. So fundamentally, we're a technology company. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to enable people who are cleverer than us and so on and, and educational experts build whatever they wanted to dream up to build, right? So enable them to do better formative assessment, do a try again feature, do homework online, build drag and drop stuff, better question types, more accessible, more interactive, more dynamic, videos, audio, video recording, like all sorts of things. We wanted to enable that stuff and just leave them with a toolkit and let them build something greater. And we were able then to use our skills, which were around technology, just to let them and enable that and kind of level the playing field. What we've done is we've kind of democratized a bunch of these function- this functionality because it used to be only massive publishers who could kind of have a team of 50 people sitting there building a, building a system. Um, they invest millions and millions of dollars in it, and what we've done is we've kind of democratized that. We've given all, we've put all these fun- this functionality together, and we allow anyone, big and small companies, have the same technology to go forward with. It's as scalable, it's as accessible, it's all of the functionality. You can do adaptive testing, you can do all sorts of stuff, and it, it democratizes it and puts it in the hands of big and small companies, and uh, and ultimately in the most amount of teachers and students hands which is where it needs to be and and again that's core part of the business model was selling to to publishers and and and, and companies so they could reach teachers and students uh because 
you know, if I was trying to do that myself, I'd have a big sales force, but, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to reach the same amount of students as I, as I can in this model. Yeah, and it's it's definitely, like Steve was saying, it's something we very very much believe in and and and, and think it's, it's, it's long overdue as well. Look, I mean, that's one thing I notice in every company I go into, every technology company in, in education and so on, there's always someone that's product manager or whatever, they've probably grown up like you guys have, I think, uh, being a teacher or being a head teacher or being something and then kind of say, and, and in their own way, they're doing exactly what I did. They don't think this is good enough and they go join a publisher to try and make it better. And they end up as the product manager for the math product or wh whatever that is. But all of these people have the same kind of passion as I have for education and they all believe it. They all believe in that mission and they're all on board with that. And, and, um, and there's definitely a kind of kinship we come across of people who kind of who really, really believe that we can make a difference here. It's a really interesting thing that just touching on what you said, where you said a lot of people that you're coming across that have a real belief and, and a thing to want to change education mm -hmm. feel they have to step out of education to do so. Which yeah. is, it, it, it's like you know the it's like I want to change the classroom, but I'm going to have to be as a teacher I have to leave the classroom to kind of change it. It's that. The step up, isn't it? It's such a strange, such a strange thing, or is it a strange thing? Not sure, but it's such a sad thing that actually to change education, we have to step out of it. Um, well, it's look, it's 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 like anything. It's just like a bigger megaphone, right? So if you're a guy with a guitar, you can be on the side of the street with people walking by or whatever it is. But like, if you want to have your your song heard, like you got to be. Oasis and you got to go to Nebworth, right? So like Noel Gallagher went from some little venue to do Nebworth and quarter of a million people a day and that kind of stuff. And that's what it's, that's what it's about. It's about, um, for me, I could have reached 30 kids at a time by trying to kind of sell my wares that way. I mean, I think about it, I came from teaching. I was teaching in the university before I started this company, right? And that was, you know, a microphone with 200 people in a room at a time. But here I am able to make a difference for 40 million students um and as i said before make the whole industry rise with that tide of that innovation so you're i don't know what the actual reach is i know how many students are, are on learnosity i don't know what the reach is of what i'm doing and it's just a bigger megaphone it's just it's you know i've i i've, I've delusions of being a rock star right so i'm talking about Nebworth or glastonbury or something <laughs> but like the analogy the analogy is true uh, in terms of it's just a bigger it's just a bigger megaphone and you see a lot of people in education trying to do that step into publishers or step into a different area just because they have a different uh, a bigger megaphone yeah definitely are you struggling to manage your school's chromebooks and looking for a solution check out the vault episode with the team from visor for features and why it can make a difference to managing your devices Visor integrates with the Google Admin Console to keep track of your Chromebook inventory and repairs. For an exclusive Edge of Futurist offer for 20% off for your first year, go to visor.cloud slash edu. That's V-I-Z-O-R dot cloud slash edu. So do you think, I'm just thinking, you know, like there's, teachers do have good ideas, don't they? Educators do have good ideas. Um, but a lot of them do feel trapped inside that inside that classroom or they feel like and and I'm speaking as someone who's just I moved away from the classroom last September um and I, and I do feel like I was I was because uh, I, I lead strategy for a group of colleges now in, in terms of digital and and I'm buying a new kit for classrooms and I'm buying it like on a on a on a scale yeah. for the college and I'm, and I'm making decisions about what we should what kind of equipment we should go for and then when it gets delivered I'm like the kid in the the kid or the teacher in me is like, oh, I wish I was using that in the classroom again. I wish I was actually face to face with the student and actually putting that tool to use because it because it excites me. That's what kind of that's where my passion comes from. Um, I, yeah, I guess it's 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 a tricky balance, isn't it, in terms of of deciding to leave and to do to try and make it better, I guess. And if everybody leaves, like we're all doomed, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and in a way, you know, are, is somebody who's been a teacher the best person to be buying software or computers or whatever? I was talking about some other part of our business there uh, recently, and it was it was around fire stations in the US, right? And the, and the software was sold kind of door to door in the fire stations. There was no kind of school district or state or whatever for these things. 
And what was happening was the um, the best longest serving like firefighter with the best moustache would become the fire chief just because of his moustache, right? And uh, and then he'd be the one buying software. He's no idea what he's doing. You know what I mean? And he's, he, he's better off. He's better off uh, fighting fires, but. You know, um, and that's kind of one of the things I was able to bring along was kind of the, the business background and so on to kind of to, to go at this. But um, yeah, it, it's 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 strange. You have the best teachers will graduate out to uh, to to being in, in in the industry, and that in itself is great, but also terrible because they're not teaching anymore. And I don't I don't know what the answer to that is, but uh, you know. It's that it's that age old age old thing, isn't it? Is that if you if you're good at a job, you get promoted to do less of that job, yeah. um, <laughs> to, to manage other people doing that job, and and ultimately, like the best maths teachers end up, like you said, being a product manager for maths or or whatever else, or being a being a head of department and teach and actually doing things less. My the best teacher I've ever seen uh, teach. It's not you, Dan. Don't don't worry. Don't get excited. I'm gonna see you. Although Dan's probably in my top like 500 teachers I've ever seen um <laughs> that's such a negative compliment <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, no one of the best one of the best teachers I've ever seen teach is um uh, was a math teacher called Alec Linden I think he's had a shout out on the podcast before as well um and uh Alec was well renowned for being like one of those genius math teachers but also was into his football a coach town team things he, he like everybody loved him he was one of those members of staff that'd stay around but even when he got promoted to edda maths and when he got like roles across schools and across the mat he made it really really clear that he was still going to teach and he was still going to have a decent um uh, curriculum responsibility because he because he felt that he lost he lost all credibility but also he lost doing the thing that he was actually really good at and i yeah. I, I suppose it's a really difficult balance to get isn't it <laughs> it's really hard to do that because you're going to be good at the other thing too and you kind of go back to the classroom and it's just going to be very difficult but um yeah it's, it's kind of hard and it's like like what we're, we're, we're pointing out here is some of the reasons why innovation and in education hasn't gone that well i mean obviously there's a lack of a lack of investment um, and um, you like more funding from the government and so on. But there is some kind of fundamental things there, like um, the best teachers are kind of graduating out to do that kind of stuff. Or, or um, you know, there's like the best software engineers want to go and build machine learning stuff for voice recognition for whatever, uh, Boeing, or I'm just using a silly example. But, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to get the, the right people in there. And and what we do generally is we're we're appealing to people who want to kind of come and change the world with us, um, who want to make a big impact, uh, because you can kind of use your. I mean, I could have if I want to make most amount of money. I could have been in oil trading or or you know, what what is something selling arms like I don't know, but like something evil. Crypto, right? and crypto, <laughs> crypto. Yeah, I mean that that in itself, right? Um, I I don't I don't get it, but they um yeah if I, if I wanted to be um yeah if I want to make most of my money, you'd be in a different industry. If you want to change the world and, and and so on, this is the kind of one to be in. Um, obviously, there's a, there's a few uh, medicine and so on, but this is this is this is a way to to really make an impact in the world. And that's kind of one of the things I'm most proud of. It's the impact that that, that we've made as, as a company and 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 how much more we're we're pushing the pushing the industry ahead. Yeah, definitely. Dan, were you going to jump on there? No. You look no, like you you're po poised, poised to speak. Um, I suppose um, as we kind of bring it bring it towards it work towards a closer, it'd be really interesting to think about um, what, where we. It's kind of a question we ask in a roundabout way to most of our guests about where we see in the future of education going and what what kind of things do we need to learn and and, and consider? Because obviously you've talked about. Um, uh, a, a future where education is a right and the need to integrate accessibility and that would be kind of fundamental as a building block for everything to go from. But hopefully I haven't stole all your ideas, but where do you think uh, the future, <laughs> where do you think we're going? Where do you think this needs to go? What what do we need to learn? Where we're going and where we need to go is probably two different things, but there's, um, th th there's, look, there is a kind of blending of, of, of learning um an assessment, I think that's happening. I think there's there's also bringing technology into the classroom, and, and people are learning more in that way. And how we assess kind of has to change. Um, I, I think there's like there's, like the, the fact that we were able to kind of well semi able to educate during COVID changes everything as well. 
It changes the way that I won't go into an office anymore or not five days a week. And kids, there's not going to be any snow days anymore, right? Um, remember the, the joyous snow days when we were kids uh, every, every so often. That's not going to happen anymore when somebody is sick or when there's a, a snow day, you'll be kind of joining into a kind of blended classroom uh, with Zoom or whatever technology kind of follows it. So there's a few things that, that are happening that are kind of exciting, but there is a sort of modernization of learning an assessment that we kind of need to get on board with and um, not banning technology from the classroom, but trying to trying to uh, integrate it and, and let people learn that way. Because that's what they're going to end up doing job-wise as well. They're going to be on, um, using technology all the time. So there's very little point in teaching them how to, you know, cur- cursive script from their handwriting and, and this kind of stuff. There's like, there needs to be a modernization of what they're doing and more, te- more, more technology education as well. As I said, I didn't really... I don't think it was too great of a computer science degrees and stuff for me to do when I back in '95 when I when I did my uh, fill in my form to see what I do in university. But there's going to be just a lot more. It needs to kind of modernize the same way as kind of university education has mostly got modernized in terms of curriculum. Agreed, agreed. So I think <clears throat> uh, you, you just as a as a kind of. Final, final. I know I, I said a final, but as a final, final thing, talk, tell people um, where to find you and to and, and and how they can get find out about more about what you do as well. So um, if they want to connect in with you and, and the work, yeah, you absolutely. Do. Um, so I'm Gavin Cooney. I'm learnosity.com. So it's learn o s i t y dot com, um, and you can get me on LinkedIn uh, or, or Gavin at learnosity.com is my email address. So feel free anyway to to reach out uh, and uh, say hello. Fantastic. Well, Gavin, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for your insights. And I think it's really important as we, every one of us that's listening to this is, is, is thinking about that idea of um, we've got, we've got a responsibility, we've got a moral responsibility to do this, but also why reinvent the wheel? Other people are inventing this wheel and are, and are sharpening this wheel. Let's, let's use that and work together and, and we all win then because we all get a product that works because other people are doing yeah, what we, we, we have do. We have enough to do rather than reinvent the wheel as well. Like let's start yeah. with wheels and go from there, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So thanks, thanks for joining us. Enjoy Austin. And uh, what we didn't get into today, what we could have got into today is you, the jet set lifestyle. Last time we spoke to you in Malta, now you're in Austin, you're about to go to San Diego and at some point you might go to Ireland as well. So, uh, but enjoy the rest of the time in Austin. I know that you said beforehand that uh, it's uh, we, we're keeping you from your lunch. So hopefully we won't <laughs> no, keep, 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 keep you too long. <laughs> so thank you very much for joining us this, uh, this evening, Gavin. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Cheers. Cheers.